So uh, anyway, so jumping into it, um, kind of what Brenda talked about in terms of using, well, use chat if you have questions. So our, our presenter, um, Richard, will uh, be presenting. And then at the end of the presentation, he can answer questions. You might be able to do it a bit earlier. Um, let me get to, and then at the end of the presentation, there'll be live questions. So you can raise your hand using the reaction feature or just maybe your own hand and Brenda can call on you and you can unmute yourself. Um, before we start the presentation, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Medea for those that aren't familiar with it. We are a 501c3 educational organization centered at the heart of San Gabriel Valley in California. And our mission is to ensure the region's technical, scientific, and industrial workforce is connected and has the tools they need to be successful. Medea provides educational programs in entrepreneurship, business finance and operations, and technology development and commercialization in settings which encourage networking and collaboration among our members. Our next meeting after this is January 13th. The presenter will be Lauren Scoville, who will be discussing the history and present activities of a local electric bus maker, Proterra. If you have any feedback on this program or idea, ideas for future programs, please send your comments and suggestions to email at mediatech.org. After the presentation, please stay on the line if you like and uh, grab your favorite beverage and there'll be a chance to receive a gift from Pacific Plate Brewery Company or your Yogurt Land. Um, and Brenda will be running that, that competition. Um, I'll turn now to introducing our presenter. Richard Johnson is a bioinformaticist with Pasadena Bio which support, Pasadena Bio supports an innovative biotechnology industry by providing education and training opportunities for potential future employees and cost-effective incubator facilities with shared equipment and office space for startup companies. So a little plug for Pasadena Bio, which is a, along with Oakcrest and a few others are, are great in, uh, incubators in this area. Richard is also an independent consultant providing education, data analysis, programming, and system design services for biotechnology companies and educational institutions. He also teaches classes in bioinformatics at Pasadena City College. Prior to entering the field of biotechnology, Richard worked in industry as an information technology manager. He managed several large projects at Southern California, Edison and TRW. Somebody's texting me. Um, Richard has a Master of Science in Bioinformatics from UCLA School of Medicine and a Master of Science in Computer Science and a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics, both from UCLA. So it sounds like Richard is a, a big time Bruin. So please welcome Richard. Oh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, and go Bruins. It's not looking too good so far this year. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, thank you for the uh, invitation. And um, I don't have anything to add to that. I think would like to talk about my last big project at Southern California Edison. I ran the Y2K project to make sure nothing happened at the year 2000. We spent a lot of money and nothing happened. That was the point. Anyway, um, if you want, I will jump in the presentation. Anything else you want to add, Bruce? Or are you? No. Uh, go ahead and enlarge. I guess you can share your screen. Yeah, I'll do that. So, uh, share, there we are. I hope that's visible to everyone. Yes. Okay, just a couple of comments. I wanted to make sure that you add questions to the chat room, uh, if you have any, and we'll try to uh, deal with those afterwards. I'd like to make it clear that my background comes from the computer and math side of things. Um, I work with uh, biotech people. So at the, uh, when I studied bioinformatics at uh, UCLA, they required that I beef my, beef up my chemistry and biological skills by taking extra classes there. So one of the important things for bioinformaticists is to be able to carry on a meaningful conversation with researchers. Uh, so I will go through this. There's an awful lot to cover in this topic in a short period of time. But I want to start off with one of my favorite quotes. Uh, computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. Human beings are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant. 
The marriage of the two is a force beyond calculation. Uh, NASA claimed that this was Einstein's quote. It, I did some research. It's actually from an economist named Chern, but I still like it. A uh, little history. And again, I feel like I have to give you some background that, uh, to get context for bioinformatics, because it is a, a pretty large topic to cover uh, in less than an hour. So in 1944, uh, Oswald Avery uh, linked hereditary units to DNA and determined that, that was a way that characteristics were passed on in animals and humans. In 1953, Watson and Crick proposed the double helix structure of DNA and its function in genetic replication. So they, they didn't actually discover DNA, but they did discover its structure. They act showed that uh, in DNA form is function. The double-stranded molecule could both reproduce exact copies of itself and carry genetic instructions. So 50 years later, sometimes I want to say only 50 years later, the first complete human genome DNA sequence was published. This is a picture of the DNA. I wanted to point out the pairing of the nucleotides, A's on the left, a pairs with T, G pairs with C, and each strand can be a template for a copy of itself. Some numbers about the human genome. So it was published in April 2003 by the Human Genome Project. At that time, I was studying bioinformatics at the UCLA School of Medicine, and one of the other grad students came in with the issue of nature and said it's published, and it was like the moon landing. We we're all very excited that it had, in fact, been published, and we're looking forward to all the wonderful things we would be able to find out about this training manual for the human body. Initially, it was estimated to take 15 years and cost $3 billion. Came in ahead of schedule and under budget a little bit, 13 years at 2.7 billion. Uh, today, a human genome can be sequenced in a day or so for about $1,000. So that is an incredible leap in technology in this period of time. Nearly 3,000 researchers in 20 institutions around the world took part. They found the human genome consists of about 3 billion base pairs, which reside in 23 pairs of chromosomes within the nucleus of all of our cells. Since 2003, over 20 revisions of the human genome sequence with improved accuracy have been released. Here we are. Again, I'm pretty much reading what I have here, and I will be happy to send this presentation to you. So just, um, if Brenda can get me your emails, I will send out copies to that so you can have it as reference. Like I said, we're going to try to get through a lot of areas in a short period of time and then leave time for some questions and discussion after the presentation. So each chromosome contains hundreds to thousands of genes which carry the instructions for making proteins. And there is an estimated 30,000 genes in the human genome, each make an average of three proteins. Now, 30,000 is a lot less than a lot of people were expecting when the human genome started because of all the different proteins characteristic, I thought maybe we had 100,000 genes. But since genes have markers where they start and end, it's fairly straightforward to see where a gene is in the human genome, and we can count them. Uh, what's interesting is it consists of two parts. There's coding DNA, which is 2% of the human genome, and non-coding DNA, DNA, which is 98%. So proteins are produced by the genes in the 2% of the coding DNA. The rest of it used to be called junk DNA, but uh, we're finding out that it does have some function, and uh, such as gene regulation, and there are probably more that we haven't discovered yet. So how do we find information in the genome? To try to give a picture of what the problem is, uh, consider the Bible contains about 3 million characters. The human genome's three billion nucleotides, which are the characters A, C, T, and G, is about equal to 1,000 different books the size of the Bible. 
one of the common tasks for researchers is to look for a sequence of nucleotides in the genome or database. So that's like trying to find out how often a particular sentence appears in a stack of books. How does it also does it appear in any other stacks of books or in any other genomes? And that's a, a big problem within and a big tool in the biotech research. Well, here's where bioinformatics, bioinformatics uh, enters the scene. There are a lot of definitions. It depends on where you study. Um, at UCLA, it was focused on DNA and amino acid and genomes, but it's the acquisition, storage, analysis, and dissemination of biological data. And it's an interdisciplinary field. You have one of the reasons there aren't very many undergraduate degrees in bioinformatics is students wouldn't have time to take anything else. They have to take uh, uh, chemistry, biology, computers, math, statistics. So usually they uh, will zero in on a subject for a, a bachelor's degree and then move into a master's or PhD program for bioinformatics. So bioinformatics uses computer programs for a variety of applications such as uh, looking at gene and protein functions, establishing evolutionary relationships, and predicting the three-dimensional shapes of proteins, since uh, the shape is actually very much what determines the function of a particular protein. Here's a picture about the disciplines, uh, biology, medicine, math, physics, computer science. I would add chemistry and statistics to that um, because it is uh, a blending of all of that. One of the reasons I moved in this direction was I, uh, my, my wife, she was going to all these interesting meetings about bioinformatics and uh, I had um, pretty much reached the limit of my tenure at Southern California Edison. And so um, I, after I took early retirement from Edison, I went back to school and uh, I had to take a lot of chemistry and a lot of biology, and I was actually helping other uh, students with uh, math and computer science. There are a lot of resources for bioinformatics, and these are online, freely available to anyone in the world. The main one for us is the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI. There's also the European Bioinformatics Institute, the DNA Data Bank of Japan, and then there are several bioinformatics companies, Genius and Distributed Bio are strong contributors to techniques for doing analysis of genetic and genomic information. Device manufacturers such as Lumina, Thermo Fisher, and Agilent provide services for users of their equipment. Um, it, they've got some, particularly Lumina have some very impressive tools for uploading results from their next generation sequencing systems, analyzing them and, and getting you access to them. And then universities can provide services for bioinformatics. So it was established in 19, NCBI it was established in 1988 as a national resource by Congress uh, for biology information. And it's charged with creating automated systems for storing and analyzing knowledge about molecular biology, biochemistry, and genetics. And they do research in advanced methods of computer-based information for processing the structure and function of molecules. And they develop, distribute support, and coordinate access to a large number of databases and a large number of tools for the scientific and medical communities. But anyone can sign up to NCBI and explore it. It's particularly the, I'll show, these are some of the databases. Um, genome contains a sequence and map data from the whole genomes of over a thousand different organisms. So if you're searching for something, you have the whole genomes for a thousand different organisms, organisms to uh, look at. GenBank is the NIH genetic sequence database. It's an annotated collection of all publicly available DNA sequences. And we'll see how many that is in, in a second. Gene is a searchable database of genes. Uh, very interesting databases, genes and disease. So it relates genetic mutations to 
gene to uh, diseases that uh, are related to hereditary or mutation problems with the genetic code. And it uh, relates the, uh, the clinical features of the diseases to the characteristics of the genes. PubMed is a huge database of documents, citations, and abstracts. And much of the information there is downloadable in free full text form. Others, uh, you have to have a subscription or belong to a university that has a script uh, subscription to get access to the documents. The whole genome shotgun is fairly new on the scene. It, these are assemblies of genomes or chromosomes that are being sequenced by a whole genome shotgun strategy. For, for instance, uh, Illumina's next generation shotgun strategies. And those are a bunch of projects that are going around and the, the projects can add their information to this database so that other people can make use of it. And protein database and over 50 more uh, databases are available in NCBI. So since the 80s, the number of sequences has grown exponentially. It's over 100 billion sequences on the right. Well, 100 million sequences on the right. On the left is the number of bases. The red line is a whole genome shotgun and the blue line is GenBank. So GenBank is the DNA database that has all the DNA sequences. The whole genome shotgun database is the, if you notice, it starts in 2003, which was when the genome, human genome was first sequenced. And it's uh, got big right away and then it's gotten uh, much bigger since. That's, now there are 10, count the zeros, trillion whole genome uh, bases in the WGS database. And there, you can see on the right the number of sequences. So the, the sequences are made up of strings of nucleotides. Since 1982 to the present, the number of bases in GenBank has doubled about every 18 months. And uh, it's probably not going to stop in the near future. NCBI has a lot of tools that are freely available uh, for researchers. And uh, I use these in my classrooms. Um, and I'll explain some of them. BLAST is one of the top tools, most used tools in NCBI. CN3D is the structure viewer. You can see structures of macromolecules and rotate them, track the sequences within the structure and see the different types of structures within each the molecules. You can look at alignments of sequences. You can determine primers for doing PCR uh, amplifications. The genome workbench, you get the tree viewer for looking at phylogenetic tree data. So we, again, we have a lot of more information about the relationships of species with uh, the DNA information. So I wanted to give you an example of bioinformatics and then how it, uh, one way it's used. So BLAST is Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. And this relates to that problem of finding a sentence in the stack of books. So in 1990, two mathematicians, yay, um, came uh, up with a method for estimating similarities between the known DNA sequence of one organism and that of another. People were already doing this with a technique called dynamic programming, but it was very slow and compute intensive. This method became the foundation for the BLAST algorithm in 1990 at the National Institute of Health. And it was 1,500 times faster than the other algorithms in use and then and now. Some of them, like FASTA, are still in use, but BLAST is much faster. And also the equipment it runs on is much faster. So now it's actually feasible for you to download BLAST and the whole human genome or any genome you want onto your home computer. And then um, 
run the blast there. That's also useful for small companies or companies that want to protect their intellectual property. They don't have to use a shared resource, even though it's protected for their own calculations. They can do it all in-house on their own equipment. And these days, there are over 100,000 blast searches done every day from around the world. That's the latest estimate I could find. I don't, uh, and that was from the end of uh, 19, uh, 2019. I'll show you a quick example of BLAST, very easy to use. I, this is one of the things that I like to teach in school. Now there's a link to a website where it goes through a nice tutorial of BLAST. Um, so there are several kinds of BLAST. On the left is a nucleotide BLAST, which is what I'll use for an example. That compares the DNA. You have a query, uh, link, link the DNA, and you want to compare it against the nucleotide database. You can also do a protein blast. Proteins are made of amino acids. You can take in a, a sequence of amino acids and search in the protein database for uh, matches. And then there are two other versions for translating between the two types of, of uh, representations of genetic information. The way you run is you, uh, copy and paste the sequence that you want to find out about in the window at the top. This one has to be a tarantula mRNA for hemocyanin. And down a little further, you indicate which database you want to use. So this is selecting the nucleotide collection, which is a, a, a curated collection of nucleotides from not only GenBank, but EMB and DD, uh, PJ, other sources. So it's a, a very large database that we compare against. So I press the button called BLAST, and at the bottom, this is a Digital World Biology, is a website that's actually owned by a friend of Wendy and, and me. It's a, Sandra Porter, Dr. Porter. She has a lot of uh, bioinformatics uh, education resources available. I've used her tutorial a lot in my classes. So I ran this yesterday with that same sequence and it took less than 30 seconds to complete. And in that period of time, it compared the query with over 60 million sequences and came up with this chart to give you a summary of what it found. Uh, explain a little bit. So the, the query is a thick red line at the top. That's what the uh, tarantula hemocyanin was. And each of the lines below is, represents a partial match with some other organism. And you can see that uh, some the top ones have very good matches. So the top one is probably the same one we put in the sequence. But others have certain areas which match, which are very good matches. Remember that uh, it's a sequence of four characters. So if you have a, a hundred characters, it's um, uh, yeah, one chance in, in four that each position has the right character, and you've got a hundred of them. So the, the probability of it happening by accident is very low. And if you see structures like this, that can point to, for instance, conserved structures among different species of the same sequence of DNA. So this is a very strong tool for uh, finding out if you found DNA in the street and you want to find out what it is, you can do this and you can get uh, a lot of, of uh, matches to a variety of species. One example is a project called the DNA Barcode. It's uh, a project started in 2007. Some friends of ours in Ventura uh, are doing this uh, among a lot of other people. But it, it's gathering um, species and 
creating a sort of a barcode. So once you get a particular marker, you can check to see if, if um, that animal that you found or fungus or, or plant is uh, in the barcode. And the way this is done, pretty straightforward, uh, extract the DNA from a tissue sample. Uh, you find a particular marker for the DNA barcode. So a good DNA barcode should have low intraspecies and high interspecies variability. That means within a species, there's very little change in the particular sequence, but there's a, a significant change between two species. So if you find a match, you can be sure, pretty sure that it's this species, or if you find a close match, you can be sure it's related. For animals, the most commonly used barcode is mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase. So a marker region, typically 400 to 800 base pairs of the gene, is amplified using PCR, preliminary chain reaction, to take that section, amplify it, and then once you have uh, that amount of it, you can sequence that section to get the sequence of DNA characters. And then that gives you the data to play against BLAST. So you upload that sequence, use BLAST, and you come back with a chart like I showed you in the previous uh, in a slide previously. So this, uh, and again, I'll, I have lots of references in this document so that you can, if you're interested in something, you can uh, go look online to see what uh, else is, is done for that. So it is big data in uh, biotechnology. You have a lot of types and formats, very large files and getting larger. Um, some problems are you have strict FDA requirements for controls, audit trails, electronic signatures, system and software documentation. And this is part of a document, uh, 21 CFR 11 strikes fear into the heart of, of uh, pharmacies and things because they can come in and see if you have a good track record for the research you're doing. Intellectual property needs to be protected. And sometimes, as we say, the data is the company and the company is the data, particularly for startup companies. We get data from a lot of sources in biotechnology. We get them from all the devices in the lab, spectrometers, sequencers, HPLC, PCR. We get graphic data from microscopes that um, uh, all kinds of types of data. There are online databases. Uh, pharmacies and large companies usually implement a laboratory information management system, a LIMS, to track the data and make sure that you have a good audit trail to protect your intellectual property. Uh, at PBC, we've had a lot of companies with intellectual property issues and they're their lab notebooks, physical and electronic, are sometimes the main source for confirming that the intellectual property is theirs or maybe it isn't theirs. So it's very important that they are maintained and obey all the rules for documentation. And also that all of this, doc, all of this data is protected from loss. We backed up on site and remotely even physical lab notebooks are copied each night and copies are, are maintained in a secure location. There are online data processing services, uh, there are company documents, publications. So the bioinformaticist, uh, the, the data person for a company needs to be able to handle all this data and uh, make sure that it's protected and secure and pr protected from loss. So a bioinformaticist needs to understand the data repositories and how to exploit them. Needs to know the software tools for genome analysis and comparison. Uh, down a little further, the, uh, the big data is uh, one of the problems. You want to make sure the data is curated, acquired, curated, made accessible for the researchers and protected from loss. And that's uh, 
again, that's a little bit different from doing analysis of the data, but you can't analyze it if you lose it. Uh, programming skills are needed to, among other things, manipulate the genomic data, but uh, one of the uh, key tasks is to be able to pipeline steps in a process so that the uh, researcher doesn't sit at the computer doing this button and then this button and then that button, but it's automated and made into a, uh, a thing so that the, you can create a program that will submit a blast search, download the results, curate the results, select the information, and, so, and store that data for another, the next step in the process. So the, the uh, bioinformaticist needs to be able to program and handle tasks like that, and in a lot of different languages. Uh, R is particularly useful. R is a, a specialized program for data statistics, and it's, uh, they have a lot of tools, much more uh, flexible and useful than uh, things like Excel, typically. Uh, it's very important that the bioinformaticists can carry on a conversation with researchers and not get lost when they start talking about all that squishy stuff that my wife works with in the biology labs. But we need to be able to understand what the researcher is looking for and work with them to figure out the ways to, with all of that data, there's information hidden there and you need to find the ways to extract the information from that data. And finally, protect the data and intellectual property from loss, damage, and theft. And that means backing up, generations of backup, off-site backup to secure locations, um, just to make sure that there is no possibility of uh, losing the data. And one of the questions is, how often do you back up? And the answer is, well, how much data can you lose? One day, one week, one month? So the cost of the backup increases with the shorter, shorter durations. So it's important to understand what you're willing to do to protect your data from loss. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, I did a search on Glassdoor and was pleased to find that I could fi find 400 bioinformatics jobs today in Los Angeles and over 3,000 in California. Uh, so I have job security. And then, uh, sorry, my phone is ringing. So most of these require an MS or a PhD in bioinformatics, computational biology or computer science. Uh, some companies uh, look for people with bachelor or advanced degree in engineering or computer science with experience in bioinformatics. So the question is how would, in a career search, how would you get in experience in bioinformatics? Um, internships are possible. Uh, volunteering, we have 30 companies at PBC. Sometimes they need uh, help with data. So if, uh, if you're willing to learn on the job and use your career, programming skills and data processing skills, you can learn about bioinformatics. Uh, some colleges offer certificates in bioinformatics, which rather than developing new tools, it emphasizes the use of existing tools for analyzing biological data. And there are a lot more tools available than there were back in 2003 when I was starting. Back then we were looking at building tools and uh, now there are a lot of tools available that can be very useful. So artificial intelligence was going to be as part of my futures of bioinformatics, but it's really the future is happening right now. Um, the amount of genome data is growing at an exponential rate, so we need something besides a programmer writing programs to do particular jobs to extract information from data. And the machine learning is a way to look for patterns in raw data in an automated way. And then deep learning uses neural networks so that it can again determine how to do feature classification from raw data. Uh, deep refers to the number of layers in the network. 
actually machine learning is being applied in biological domains, in genomics, proteomics. I saw some very impressive examples of uh, machine learning used in diagnostic of uh, a problem, a particular disease of the eye. The uh, neural network was much, was at least as good as uh, the ophthalmologist and often better finding things. So that's one example that um, Google uh, gave a presentation on and has involved with. And again, this is a, Wikipedia is a source of a lot of this since it's uh, easily available and covers a lot of the areas. So UCLA's Institute for Quantitative and Computational Biosciences is an example where what they call the current tsunami of biological information can be uh, examined, used uh, for progress. They're looking at the biological basis of health and disease by tapping the power of big data and computational modeling. Uh, I was um, gratified to find out that a number of my professors from the early 2000s are still there and uh, uh, doing good stuff. And this is getting to be a bigger part of the bioinformatics picture. The result of what they're trying to do is uh, not only personalized healthcare, but precision medicines. One of the problems is that you may be told by the doctor that this medication is 80% effective with people with your problem. So how do you find out if you're one of the 20% where it won't work? And with the advent of cheap genome, personal genome sequencing and data processing to find the patterns of, of uh, what doesn't work with a particular medicine, you may be able to do more reliably predict whether this medicine will work for you, not that it's 80% probable working for you. So that's precision medicine. So this is one of the uh, big uh, advances we are hoping for as we get more data and more capability for analyzing that data. This is the future. Uh, quantum computing has been around for a while and uh, Microsoft and IBM uh, say quantum computing will enable scientists to solve problems that actually can't be done on classical computers. Uh, or if it takes a long time, the quantum computers would be able to uh, do it in seconds or day, hours or days. Examples are cryptography, which is factoring large keys, uh, is a very time consuming project by uh, problem for classical computers, what we all use. Quantum computing techniques take advantage of the weirdness of quantum processing and do basically instant solutions to problems like that. At the present time, actual quantum computers have small numbers of quantum bits or qubits. So there limits the complexity of problems they can solve. And IBM, Microsoft, and others provide access to quantum computer simulations simulators with larger numbers, but it's just simulation. So there's classical computer pretending it's a quantum computer, but uh, you can log in for free, learn how to program quantum computers and uh, run jobs. And if you have a smaller program, you can actually get access to a real quantum computer and run the program. The books are available in quantum computer programming, including one by my oldest son, Eric. He was my resource for this information. It's Programming Quantum Computers, Essential Algorithms. And it's a, a very readable book. It doesn't depend a lot on the, what is a quantum computer. Uh, like uh, programming books don't go into transistors and things uh, to teach you how to program. But it, it will tell you this is a quantum computer and these are the, are the operators and here's how you string them together. At, at the present time, um, quantum computing has two competing camps, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, NISC, and fault tolerant quantum computers. These are FT machines. 
And um, as my son told me, so far, neither type of quantum computer has solved a problem anyone actually wanted to solve for some commercial or scientific end. The ones that are advertised are pretty much demonstration programs that find a problem that a classical computer can't solve and a quantum computer can and run it and solve it, but it's not a useful program. It's just a demonstration that there are some things classical computers can't do and quantum computers can. The first implementation of quantum computers will be as coprocessors for classical computers, like graphics processing units are right now. A lot of computation can be performed on a classical computer, getting the data ready, extracting things, but then you get to the part it can't do, like factor a large number, so that's passed off to the quantum coprocessor sitting there ready to take the job and give you the answer. Um, and that's exactly what it does. You send off the information to the quantum computer and then you read the result. So science, scientists and researchers predict that there will be a useful quantum computer within five years. Uh, they've been saying that for 10 or 15 years. So stay tuned. There is potential because both IBM and, and Microsoft point to quantum chemistry as a first application for quantum computing. And this is really critical in the area of biotechnology because all of the, the uh, proteins and things that's a quantum chemistry environment. So we would be using a quantum system, a quantum computer, to simulate a quantum system, quantum chemistry. Interestingly, about 40 years ago, this was also Richard Feynman's opinion. And I love this quote, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it a quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look easy. So that was uh, here in Pasadena in 1982. So that's um, uh, pretty much the quickest introduction I could give you to bioinformatics. Uh, I hope I've triggered some uh, ideas and questions and then we can spend the rest of uh, our time here uh, discussing that. Uh, so I'll turn it back to uh, Bruce. Thank you for allowing me to do this. Okay, so you're still sharing your screen. I guess you can, I can, we can see people. Um, so I asked a question about in the chat about 23andMe and Ancestry.com and, and, you know, 23andMe, I guess, helps you determine whether, or they're able to determine whether you not have a tendency to do X, Y, or Z or something like that. Is, is that basically bioinformatics being big data being used? Uh, well, they don't sequence, they don't give a sequence of your genome. They don't get a sequence of your genome. So they don't have that level of information. What they do have is information about your genetic history and can tell you uh, a lot of things about uh, where your ancestors came from. So what the way that works is, uh, again, using markers in your, in your DNA uh, there's a history of particular sequences that uh, uh, develop. What have, as populations migrated and stayed in a certain place, that group would get a series of mutations that stayed with the DNA of that group. And then that group moves again to another location and a new series of mutations. So we have the old mutations and the new mutations. And that is what, how they're able to when you go to 23andMe or any of the others, you say, here is your biological history. And it's used by bioinformatics, uh, finding the locations of these particular markers, seeing which ones you have and do that. That's a quick introduction. Again, I'm not a biologist or a researcher, but again, that's a, a popular thing. But there is other information. Another, is that? Uh, okay. 
We do have another question. Uh, Filippo is asking uh, whether or not you can speculate about the impact that informatics might have on the accelerated production of the COVID vaccine that has been recently in introduced. Well, certainly they're making use of all the techniques we talked about. And those are, uh, if you look at some of the, one of the things they were able to do is sequence the different strains of COVID and get a map of, of where the COVID, uh, each strain started and where it ended up. So uh, there's a very interesting uh, chart of uh, what route the COVID vaccine is taking through the world. And that is all bioinformatics and it's certainly helping things out. Did you have any follow-up, Felipe? Now, the question I might have is how it, <clears throat> The, you know, the, the, the announcement was made that the, um, the vaccine is actually not, not, a, uh, not, part, not using a dead um, infection, but actually using a synthetic material that is not, so that, that, is, that is really departed from the, uh, from the standard way of making a, a vaccine uh, in previous generations for other, for other um, maladies that we, that we have encountered. So I just wonder how that, that, that may have played a, a role in that the informatics. Uh, certainly provides the data and the knowledge about the sequences, but I don't know a lot about the process of procedures for that kind of research. Okay, thanks. Yeah. No, I have Jeanette? Some Jeanette has a question and then uh, we can go back to uh, Darcy who's got a question as well. Go ahead, Jeanette. So my question is, um, in a lot of my research, I'm coming across uh, health and wellness companies that are claiming to offer uh, DNA or genetic based um, wellness programs. And I don't know, my BS meter is usually deep on the red at that point. But can, can you tell me if there's any accuracy to those claims or if that's if we're just not there yet? Well, um, there are a lot of I'm not sure exactly what, what they promised, but in general, um, there are genetic mutations that are associated with disease or the possibility of disease. Now, mm -hmm. if you have the mutation, it doesn't guarantee that you're getting the disease, but you may have a tendency for the disease. So it's a combination of your genetic makeup and your environment. And the environment, uh, when they uh, do these studies, it's not just the air you breathe is what you eat, do you exercise? So it's a combination of all of those factors and a tendency toward a particular problem. So you can get a whole list, you can get genetics testing, and they will give you the list of things that you uh, are potentially susceptible to because they are very specific genetic mutation, mutations that can be found in your DNA. And that's very straightforward forward process it, and it's becoming cheaper. So it's probably why they're advertising more. So the idea that certain supplements or types of exercise versus other types of exercise based on your DNA is, is a real possibility? That is because it certainly, if you say that um, you have a tendency, you know, I have a tendency toward high cholesterol, but I have diet and exercise. So uh, my dad didn't, he died young. So this is a, you know, one of the things. So we had a, pretty much the same DNA, but we have a, a very different health um, characteristics. So the, the DNA can provide a tendency. And so they can give you guidance about for this particular disease, these are the things that help. Or sometimes there may be medications or something or cert, you know, and uh, things are on the horizon for um, which I don't understand as well as I should, but uh, inserting uh, proteins in, into that become part of you that affect the progress of the disease. So those are, you know, there's some like the eye uh, therapies now that use that to solve it. Again, that's in the in the documentation. I don't know a lot about the details. But, um, and, and a follow-on question to that would be these proteins that can be inserted, 
Um, are they replicated within your body? And if yep. so, are they passed along to your children as well if you have them? Depends on if they get in the germline, but yes, they can be. Uh, there, there is that possibility for certain things. I understand. Okay. So let's go talk about our favorite Pasadena physicist type, uh, Mr. Feynman. Darcy is ah. asking for a little bit better description about the uh, Feynman quote that you listed about nature not being classical, but quantum. Tell us more. Well, um, uh, if you look at the atomic structure, a lot of the stuff is happening on the quantum level so that in that um, reference that I gave you, it uh, lists a whole bunch of reasons why classical uh, classical approaches are not adequate for quantum nature. There, there are time shifts, and there are all sorts of things. You make uh, all sorts of um, uh, simplifications if you try to use classical computation to solve a quantum problem. And, Again, it's remarkable that he came out to that. that, that that's a, there are a lot of interesting papers in that journal to read, so you have the reference there. But it uh, actually talks about why it's a difficult problem, and it comes up with this final uh, thing that nature isn't classical, it's quantum. Did you get any follow up, Darcy? <laughs> um, no, not now. Thank you very much. I love reading Feynman. It's he's so entertaining. <laughs> Girl, you're joking. <laughs> yes. One of his favorite things. But no, yes. that was oh. one of Feynman's quote. Uh, sure, uh, it was a Surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. There's a book about Feynman. So I have that in my library. And a question from down under, Jamal. You want to uh, talk of more a little bit about the computer <laughs> at UC Santa Barbara, I suspect. Yeah, I just, um, I had read an article less than a year ago about- Can you um, speak up? You're a long way away and I can't hear you. Um, I read an article. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I read an article uh, when I was in Santa Monica about six, seven months ago about a computer I think Google's working on a, a large scale cubic computer. And I, I think it's at UC Santa Barbara, but I'm not sure. And the only takeaway was that they really didn't know what this thing was capable of. So they had it frozen or in a part frozen state. Um, I can't remember exactly how many qubits it is, but it's a fairly large one. I just wanted to know if, if in your research, if you had come across that or uh, you have any insights as to how Google plays out in the quantum computer area? Well, there are a lot of uh, players in the field right now, large and small. I said my, my son works for a small quantum computing company in uh, Palo Alto. And um, the main problem is that you have to freeze uh, quantum computers in order to uh, allow the qubits to stay around long enough to be useful because they're very much affected by noise, temperature, things like that. So um, I'm trying to remember, he gave me a picture of the one qubit is, a size, is in a structure the size of a refrigerator, so, but it because it needs all the cooling capability. So it's uh, probably similar with, with Google. Everybody needs to use incredible, they freeze it down, down to uh, absolute zero temperatures close to that so that there's stability for the qubits. Yeah, but uh, there are a lot of players right now. Google is certainly one of the players there that I didn't mention. But um, I think uh, IBM is doing a lot more advertising about their uh, progress and capabilities. We'll hopefully see some good stuff in a few years. So and how Chris Victor, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you have posted in here? You've given us a link about uh, sequencing data for COVID. Ah. Yeah, I think that was the, um, what uh, Rich mentioned. Um, it's basically um, scientists started uh, sequencing um, the COVID genome very early on and doing essentially 23andMe on, uh, on COVID to figure out where it came from. And that was um, 
probably the news that you all heard was when um, it came out that actually um, the the New York the New York the first wave in New York was seeded uh, by mainly uh, a European um, COVID, whereas uh, the first um, strains that arrived on the West Coast were actually from from China. So mm. that was based on this information. You can click through it. And uh, again, this is exactly what Rich said. When you look at it, the, the amount of data is just absolutely incredible. Um, so now that it's been going on for so many months, you can actually track back the origin of pretty much every single strain that's around and the, and the differences and where they come from and how they migrate and how quickly they migrate. It's absolutely fascinating data. And the mutations. Mm -hmm. yeah, how quickly it changes. Actually, yeah. it doesn't change very much, but um, still enough to, to track the changes over time. It looks like Wendy Johnston wants to ask a question. Yeah, I can oh, I have to answer her. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, I'm contributing something. I'm not asking a question. I know oh, better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're finding that clinical trials are more cleverly done now because with more genomic data, you can match the people in the trials to the problem you're trying to solve. And some people are, uh, wouldn't be good in a trial if you actually knew how their genetics related to the thing you are investigating. Uh, instead of taking a random assortment of people demographically and, and doing an experiment, giving them a certain therapy uh, and looking at the results, if you, if you choose, if you select based on some genomic principle, uh, their reaction to something or their sequence for, for something, uh, you can more carefully, uh, this is personalized or precision medicine, you can more carefully determine if in fact there's a cohort of people that your product uh, is good for. Maybe not for everybody, but maybe really well for this group of people. So. Mm. I think uh, Mark has a question. Or is that a hand? So when we, when we were in first year of college, there was no double helix. We're old. In the, in the classroom, there was no double helix. Is there a single at that point? I'm sorry? Was that a single helix at that point? No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> we knew there was DNA, but. Okay. For me, as a as a newer newer addition to the science community, um, for me it was actually very opposite because I basically started doing research just before the the human genome the whole thing got published, and it was all like, "Yay, we we got it sequenced. Now we're done, right?" Uh, it's basically we've discovered everything there is because we know all the sequence that the whole sequence and all the diseases are going to be cured because now we know everything there is to know. And then as always in science, it was, oops, um, yeah, we thought so, but it turns out that things are far more complicated um, than we believed. So um, one, one of the examples to illustrate that is that um, certain cancers, for example, have a very, very strong genetic component. So you can to a certain degree predict um, if somebody's gonna get cancer or not. And one is the, the breast cancer BRCA2 um, sequence where you can say, okay, if someone has that sequence, there is a high probability, but it's never a hundred percent. It's actually, it's typically 80% in the strongest cases and very often it's then down to 20, 30% where sure, you know the sequence, you know your genome, but it's actually a pretty poor predictor of what's going to happen to you disease-wise. And that's where I see the dangers with all of those uh, 
um, 23andMe and they, uh, they, all of those companies got in trouble for, for doing that, right? When you try to tell people based on that little snippet of, of information um, that you have a high risk of dying from I don't know what and it's absolutely meaningless in, in practice because it's just one part of the whole puzzle. So my message in all of this would be biology is still far more complicated um, than we can um, we can analyze even with today's fantastic methods. So Any, it's a quantum problem, then not not a classical problem. <laughs> Any, it's beyond that. So yeah. just um, antibodies, right? Our, how our, our immune system makes antibodies. When you look at the numbers. Um, our immune system, I forgot now the numbers, but um, it, it's in the 10 to the 20, 20 something um, different antibodies that our immune system can make. So it, the, the numbers are just astronomical, right? It's, it's beyond even what we can, what we can al analyze with, with our current computers and our current data storage and processing capability. So it, it's, it's far from over. <laughs> As Rich said, it's really, to, to a certain degree, it's only the beginning. Any um, IT, crowd, IT crowd fans out there? There's the episode where Dave gets the software that predicts how much longer he has to live. Have you seen, <laughs> anybody seen that? It's epic. It's like four days and he has complete nervous breakdown. Yeah, but he has to turn it off and turn it back on again. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, Rich and I had a student who was studying, uh, went to grad school studying bioinformatics. He was working with yeast. He is now one of your favorite craft brewers. <laughs> yeah, Steve Cardenas. Uh, at uh, Pacific Plate is uh, one of our, our old students and uh, he quit grad school to start at the brewery. And that's a that's a very good point. We've got some <laughs> here and we'll have a quiz question when we break out into our uh, yeah. drink and speak session. But I think before we go to that, uh, Mark, I thought you had your question up earlier. Do you Did you have a question? You'll have to unmute, Mark. I actually hadn't written a question, but I was thinking um, I'm a practical person. So I was, uh, the uh, inf bioinformatics seems to be uh, basically a science to help us analyze. Uh, and then the applications seem to be the better medicines, better prediction of diseases. I was just wondering if that's what I picked up from the presentation. Are there other applications that uh, are forthcoming? That's an interesting noise. Oh, yeah. Is it, I don't know who that is. I don't um, either. Yeah, there are lots of applications for the technology uh, and not, but it, mostly it's the ability. I'm trying to think of something. I mean, if you're certainly, if you're doing research about, uh, of a library, you know, you can use BLAST to look through text of the library. Um, so if you're doing research there, because any any time you're handling large amounts of data, the bioinformatics approach is try to develop a smarter algorithm, and don't you do it by brute force? So the techniques of bioinformatics can be applied in a lot of areas. I think that's a quick opinion. And Mark, if if you are following our LinkedIn group. Uh, I just did, I just posted this afternoon a market research report about bioinformatics and some of the companies that are involved in it. Um, that there's a link on LinkedIn to some of that research. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to let Richard get off the hot seat and uh, officially wrap it up. So thank you, Richard, for your presentation. We'll um, yes, talk to you around. Uh, and uh, if anyone has wants to follow up, feel free to email me. Um, I, my email is uh, in the chat. Pardon? Is it in it the is chat? It's posted in the chat. Okay. 
Yeah, and I will be happy to send you a copy of the presentation as long as I have any. I can blast, I can send that out to everybody who signed up, um, even if they didn't actually attend. If you okay. Me. Um, yeah, I will send you the copy first then. Okay, and so thank you, Brenda, also for helping out, and and we're going to recess to the uh, uh, soda fountain, the virtual soda fountain. So okay. if you want to hang out and chatting, uh, please do so, and we'll. Uh, go to there. So thanks again. Perfect. I'm going to sign off from the, the recording right now.